Okay, well, let's go ahead and pray and get started in Zechariah 12. Lord, thanks for the opportunity to um, discuss this together so that we have a better chance of, of uh, just understanding how it applies to our lives and what it means and dissecting it together. Uh, Lord, give us, give us understanding tonight. This is a hard chapter. Give us understanding of exactly how we're to take it and share it with other, others and apply it to our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start this off a little different than we normally do. Um, normally we just go section by section, but I want to start off reading the whole chapter. Do it Fred style. Reading the, the whole chapter. And uh, um, there's two questions I want us to focus on as we read this whole chapter. So the first question is, as Zechariah writes, thus declares the Lord in verse 1, and as we go through the whole thing, do we know which member of the Godhead is speaking? You might think it's multiple ones. You might think it's one, but, you know, it. can we tell which member of the Godhead? And then the second question is, this chapter is talking about a future <clears throat> war. Do we know from the text what future war it's talking about? And so those are the two questions I want you to think of as I read through. So I'm going to read through the chapter. Then we're going to discuss some overhead, some overview things, kind of get us the whole um, frame of reference of, and context of what this is talking about. And then we'll dive in to the first five chapters after that. I'm five <laughs> verses after that. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Haven't had much food for the last it's month, so, you know, my mind, up. my words might not connect. All right. So let's go ahead and read chapter 12. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples all who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. In that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness. But I will watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves. So they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell on their own sites in Jerusalem. The Lord also will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of hadad Rimen in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves the family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shemites by itself and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself and their wives by themselves. That's the chapter. We're not normally going to do it that way because I get lost if I read the whole thing. But as we, as we read through that, <clears throat> so we're looking for the answer to two questions. So then if we look at the first question in verse 1, as Zechariah writes, thus declares the Lord. Do we know which member of the Godhead this is this is that's speaking? How can we let me ask let me ask you this question? How can we find out? 
So if we go through and try to figure out who's who in the Godhead, how do we find out? We mentioned this. Hebrew. You can look in the Hebrew. Okay, that's one way. What's another way? Well, I don't know if that would tell you in the Hebrew. It would because when it says the Lord, it's yud heh vav and it's a given name of God or the proper name of okay. God the Father. Okay, but Jesus also is referred to as that name. No. No? No. Okay, so which, which of them says that name? Which of them? Yes. Well, in NASB 77, yud heh vav is always capital letters L-O-R-D. Ah, okay. So I have the cheat sheet. <laughs> okay. Um, that's interesting. I don't know if I, I'd, I'd have to look at that more because the other way to do it is to go through and see if you can identify one and then backtrack back and forth and see if it's the same one. So that's going through, um, if we look at verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So we know that's the Holy Spirit. So that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Who's the me? Who's the me who they have pierced? That's Jesus, right? So if that's Jesus, is anyone else speaking as we go through that? I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the uh, the spirit of grace and supplication, so they will look on me. Well, that means the I in verse 10 that starts off is also Jesus. So then as we go back and in that day, looking at verse 9, in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Is that Jesus? Or is that, as you go back, you can kind of track through it. Really what I want you to get, I don't really care. I mean, we can agree, we can disagree on who's who. But what I want you to get is this is a way to go through and to figure out who's speaking. So if you can go through and you can identify one place, you can backtrack and go through and mark. You can use a triangle for God the Father, a little dove sign for the Spirit, and a cross for Jesus. As soon as you identify one, then you can go through and kind of see. And, and I can normally figure out who Jesus is. I can't always figure out who God the Father is. Because as I look through it, I know some words are used both for God the Father and for Jesus. But we know for sure that the one in verse 10 is Jesus. We also see it starts with the burden of the word of the Lord. Who's the word of the Lord? Well, the word of the Lord is Jesus. So it's just kind of interesting. Um, does it matter all that much? Well, yes and no. What, it, it doesn't matter on each particular item, but it does matter that we're seeing Jesus referenced and referred to and speaking in the Old Testament. And this was, as we see that, so they will look on me whom they have pierced. This is written 500 years before Jesus even came. Isn't that amazing? That, that's just mind-blowing. Mind the other reason that it's super important for us to get is because John 14, 6 says, No one comes to the Father except through me. So the Jews, in order to be saved... Um, they have to come to know Jesus. Are we going to save the Jews? No, absolutely not. We're not going to save the Jews. We're probably not even going to have a conversation with a Jew that's going to make any difference. It's going to be a Jew that speaks to the Jew, and it's only going to be by the Holy Spirit. It's normally not a Gentile that makes a difference with the Jew. But we want to make sure we're proclaiming Jesus wherever it is in Scripture. So just something kind of, I always think is kind of cool, kind of important. We see them both in the New Testament and the Old Testament. What about the other question? Can we tell from this chapter which war? Can we tell from the text which war this is talking about? Let, let me ask you a question. Verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. When is this going to happen? It's after his back. What? Pierced. Yes, but when, when are they going to look? I mean, this is future, future, way future prophecy it hasn't happened yeah. yet. Where are they going to, where are they going to look on, G, look at Jesus? Second coming, yeah. which is when? Into the tribulation, right? So into the tribulation, that's the reference here in verse ten. It's the end of the tribulation. Therefore, which war 
is this talking about? Armageddon. It's talking about Armageddon. How else do we know from the text that it's talking about Armageddon? Look at verse 3. What's verse 3 say? It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for the peoples, and all who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. When are all the nations of the earth going to be gathered against Jerusalem? Armageddon. Armageddon. When you see, see how we can kind of figure that out? Um, so, since we know that the context of this chapter is Armageddon, let's go read real quick about Armageddon and refresh our minds on that. So there's two chapters that tell us about Armageddon. It's Revelation 16 and Revelation 19. Um, specifically, Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16. I'm going to give you a minute to get there and then we're going to read it because we just want to understand the context and Armageddon is going to take place in uh, the um, plain of Megiddo, also known as the Jezreel Valley. In your study guide, if you have that, there was a map that I listed there that you can see where Megiddo is, okay? So if, now you should have time to get there. Revelation 16, verses 12 through 16, telling us about the setup for Armageddon. And it says, verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God going down to verse 16 and they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon okay so this great battle between Jesus and the armies of the whole world that are under the influence of the Antichrist and the false prophet is called in English Armageddon we know that you know we absolutely know that and then sometimes you hear Har-mageddon, starting with the H, H-A-R-mageddon. That's the Hebrew for Armageddon. And what Har-mageddon means is Mount of Megiddo. That's how we know that the battle is going to take place at Megiddo. So where is Megiddo located? Again, in that study guide, you have the map. Megiddo is located 56 miles north of Jerusalem in northern Israel. Um, it's a location, the plain of Megiddo is a location of many ancient battles. And we've mentioned before, how many, I, I, I know Fred and Sonia, and I don't know if um, some of us follow a teacher uh, by the name of Amir Sarfati. He is a Jew from the tribe of Judah who lives in Israel. <coughs> And his house overlooks the plain of Megiddo. Can you imagine? I mean, he is, he is putting his money where his mouth is, saying, I believe the rapture will happen before Armageddon. You know, he's going to be in the thick of it. But if you, if you look at that second picture in the study guide, which shows the, the Mount Megiddo, and then it shows the plain around it, you can see... Um, both above it and below it, there are neighborhoods. There are houses. I don't know where Amir Sarfati is in that, but I, I, I saw that picture and thought, wow, do these people know? I mean, do they get what's going to happen? Are they all pre-trib? Or do, I, I bet a bunch of them don't even, you know, really, really know, really get it. But uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to see what it looks like today. So that's the location now, let's read what the other text says, Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. And again, the reason we're doing this is because this is the context of this chapter. It's Armageddon. So we want to read and refresh our memories. Revelation 19, verse 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him with, 
which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. That's us. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that he, so that with it he may strike down who? The nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It'll be interesting to see what that Lord is. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all the men, both free men and slaves, as small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him, who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who performs the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. It's kind of a gross passage, but it gives us a, a view of Armageddon. So this final, remember that the battle of Armageddon, it's a battle, but there's campaigns. There's dif different campaigns. This is the final campaign where they're, sta they're going against... Um, this is describing a final campaign where they're going against uh, Jesus. But what we're looking at is Zechariah 12. This is a campaign where they're going against Jerusalem. Jerusalem is 56 miles south of Megiddo. There's different campaigns of this battle. Okay. So now that we know the context, now let's go back. I'm going to read this one more time. Ver Zechariah 12. First five verses. Now we get what's going on. Now let's reread it and let's ask some questions. First five verses, Zechariah 12. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples and who lift it, I'm sorry, all who lift it will be severely injured and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. In that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness, but I will watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the Lord of hosts, their God. Okay, so first we see, um, as we start off here, the burden of the word of the Lord comes to Israel. And, and then we see this declaration of who God is. Um, that declaration of who God is, that fits scripture for both God the Father and for Jesus. Because when we see the Lord who stretched out the heavens lays the foundations of the earth, that matches Colossians 1.16, by him all things were created, speaking of Jesus. Then it says, forms well, this... But doesn't it even the first sentence do the same thing? What are, you, what are you talking about? I'm sorry. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. When I saw that, I thought of John 1, in the beginning was uh, the yeah. word... And the word was with God, and the word was God. I, yeah, exactly. So, Every time I see the word of the Lord, I keep thinking, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. Is that Jesus coming to Zechariah? I mean, it's just kind of cool. So even the first sentence that made me think it was Jesus because of the because of, I'm, in, I'm in John in my daily study. Yeah, so. I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so when it um, said the word of the Lord, I thought, okay, the word was with God, the word was God. And then it says, forms the spirit of man with him. Um, let's let's reread that. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. We're made in the image of Jesus. So, um, again, we got to be careful of separating out. It, it, we, we serve one God, and that God exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and Jesus. Um, help me. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. 
But those, the God, the different persons or the different way he manifests himself, he plays different roles. And so sometimes we can see that it's clearly God the Father. Sometimes we can see it's clearly God the Son. Um, when I see it's God the Son in the Old Testament, I just get really excited because it, the what Chip just read, John 1, 1, the word was God and the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. When I see it in the Old Testament, it reminds me he's always existed. And look how the prophecy was told clearly about Jesus 500 years before he took on human flesh through the through the birth of, of uh, through Mary, you know, just kind of cool, just really kind of cool. Um, so this is one of the final campaigns of Armageddon. Notice then what it's describing. And, and when you when you're trying to figure this out, looking at verses two and three and Patty, I did that you mentioned earlier, you thought it was kind of hard, kind of confusing. I thought so too. So then I had to start like parsing it out and making lists. Um, verses two and three give us a list. It's, it's two different metaphors used to describe how God will use Jerusalem to trap the nations. Two different metaphors. God's going to use Jerusalem. So it says, behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem, yada, 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 um, against all the nations of the earth. So what's the yada, yada? How is he going to use Jerusalem? We, there's two different descriptions there. One, in verse 2, he says, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. What in the world does that mean? A cup that causes reeling. Well, um, to figure that out, I immediately start, I do two things. One, I go to Bible Hub, look at Strong's Concordance for reeling to see what that is. And a cup of reeling means a cup of drunkenness. And then I'm like, okay, all right, drunkenness. Then I go and I read it in a couple different versions. So then I went and read it in New Living Translation, and here's what it says. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. Oh, that makes so much more sense. So these armies are going to come against Jerusalem, and they're just going to be dumbfounded. They're not going to accomplish anything at all. They're, they're just going to, you know, their minds are it's like they haven't eaten like I haven't eaten. They're just, they're going to be foggy brain. They're not going to be able to accomplish anything. And then verse 3, what's it say? I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people. All who lift it will be severely injured. Again, I was like, okay, I'm not really sure I understand that. Looked at New Living Translation. I'll make Jerusalem an, immo an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. All right, that makes more sense. How are they going to try to move Jerusalem? What does that mean? It means they want to take it out. They want to destroy it. So as they try to come against it to destroy it, what happens to them? Then they also try to change it. They what? Like change it politically? No. Wipe it out. They want to destroy it. They want to remember one of these is Iraq. They want to wipe it off the face of the earth. They hate the Jews. They want to destroy it. And so what's going to happen? They're going to hurt themselves as they destroy it. Um, so as these nations are coming against Jerusalem, they get, they just get messed up. They just, they can't accomplish anything. What's amazing about that? How big is Jerusalem? Not very big. Tiny, right? I mean, if all of Israel is the size of New Jersey, how big is Jerusalem? It's tiny comparatively. And all the nations are going to come against it and they can't destroy it? Wow. What, what do you think the Jews who are in Jerusalem are going to think when, when all the, I mean, this massive armies are, and they can't destroy it? Mm -hmm. wow. No, it's not their power. What? Yeah. They're going to know it's not their power. Exactly, which is what we get when we go to verse 5. Read that, Tina. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. 
Yeah, and then I also wanted to read that one in New Living Translation. It says, and the clans of Judah will say to themselves, the people of Jerusalem have found strength in the Lord of heaven's armies, their God. They're going to realize, oh, wow, this was God. This was God fighting for us. We, this, I mean, they're getting some strength here to do some fighting, but there's no way. It was obviously God. So what will that do to them? Demoralize them completely. It's going to what? Demoralize. Demoralize the Jews? No, no, the uh, opponents. I'm sorry, and I didn't clarify that. Yeah. So what will it do to the Jews? Well, I think we'll see the error of their ways. It's going to humble them tremendously, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because the Jews today, it's like, you know, Israel, do you, do you see what we've accomplished? Do you see the inventions we've made? Do you see the, the vast amount of fruits that we've done? There's a little bit of pride in Israel. This is going to humble them. Man, it's God. That also means the inventions that they've had, the fruit that they've had, the growth that they've had, guess what? It's God. So it's a huge reminder to me. I mean, I, I got to tell you guys, um, I don't like to talk about this kind of thing, but I will just tell you, over literally the last month, I have had very, very little food. I mean, about two days of full meals, and other than that, this much food, um, because I'm having major colon problems. And when you don't eat, you have brain fog. You just And so you're hearing me miss some things, but I'm telling you, if you get anything out of this, it's not me. It is absolutely, if you ever, even, even if I have food, if you ever get anything out of it, it's not me. It's not me. It has to be God. And so it, it checked myself to remind myself, if I ever accomplish anything, whether it's Bible study or anything else, it is not me. It's never me because I'm, not, I'm nothing but a lump of clay. It is not me. It is God. It is absolutely God. So that's one of the things that I got out of this, just a huge reminder to make sure I'm not being prideful. It is absolutely God. If I, if I understand Scripture at all, it's God giving me the understanding. Now, before we go on to verses 6 through 9, what else do you guys see that you want to talk about, ask about, in verses 1 through 5? So, I'm just trying to get a big picture here. So, you do a great job of that, too. Hmm? You do a great job of that. That's, I mean, you've jumped in here in the middle of this study, and you're just right with us. So, um, uh, so what's happening in Armageddon at this point, the Antichrist is still controlling uh, Jerusalem. There, it's and still, he's still controlling all these nations, bringing them against Jerusalem. Okay, but I thought he was actually in Jerusalem. Sitting that's true. Yeah, that's true. His headquarters is in Jerusalem. That's a good point. Okay. But he's the one gearing this attack. We know the timing of it uh -huh. is when Jesus comes back. We know that God's protecting him. So this is towards the end. Gotcha. And so he's taking all the nations and trying to attack Jerusalem because okay. of God. But look also what it says. Um, let's see, hold on here. I'm trying to find it. All the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Who is, who is setting it up for this to happen? Oh, God is. God is. He's going to defeat them, yeah. but he's the one setting the whole thing up, too. Yeah. Kind of kind of interesting. Sure. You know, I'm going to bring them all against it, and then I'm going to defeat them. <laughs> Anything else? Let's go on to 6 through 9. In that day I will make the clans of Judah. Here comes another couple of, another couple of similes here. I will make the clans of Judah, two similes, number one, like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves. So they will consume on the right and on the left all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of, uh, inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell on their own sites of Jerusalem. Yeah, that was twice. The Lord also saved, the Lord also will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. 
And in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So, two similes are used to describe Judah. And really we can think Israel when we see Judah. Uh, but we'll hold off discussing that for a little bit. Um, it, it's talking about how Judah is going to triumph over his enemies. Two similes. What's the first one? It's the pot inside the blazing fire. The fire pot among pieces of wood. Mm -hmm. And if, if there's a fire pot in the middle of pieces of wood, you could see how that would burn up, you know, that could burn up wood. And then the flaming torch among sheaves. What are sheaves? I had to look that up. I didn't know. It's a, a bundle of grain stalks tied together. Okay, a flaming torch among grain stalks. Boy, that would go up fast, wouldn't it? That's the description of how Judah is going to triumph over its enemies. It's going to burn them up. Now, this wording is used in several other verses uh, in, in other places. So there's, and I mentioned those in the study guide, Isaiah 47, 14, Obadiah 18, and Malachi 4, 1. So I'm just going to read those so we see the similarities. Isaiah 47, 14 says, Behold, they have become like stubble. Fire burns them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. That could be said in this same verse here. And then Obadiah 18, Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be as stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them, so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Different context same verbiage. Malachi 4.1, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. So again, we're, we're, just, we're seeing this, uh, this wording that if we would have probably studied Isaiah, Obadiah, and Malachi, we would have gone, oh yeah, all right, I get it, I know what it's talking about, but this is new terms for us. Now we get it, but when I first read it, I, I, I don't really, I don't really get what it's talking about. I had to keep circling. All right, it's Judah. All right, there's similes to to work my way through this text. Um, but this defeat of the nations, it's not going to come by Judah's strength. What does it say in verse seven? The Lord will build salvation. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first. So who's doing it? It's the Lord. The Lord is, is, even if they are empowered, who's the one empowering? You know, when Samson defeated the Philistines the, and, you know, tied the fox to, foxes together with the torches and all that he did, was it his strength? No. It was God. the strength that God gave him, right? Boy, that's a, that just seems like that's such a huge point to get that we all, I mean, we can look at them and go, oh, they don't get it, they don't get it, oh, they're finally going to get it. We don't get it either. We don't get it either, mm -hmm. you know? This is where I kind of started to struggle. Okay. So, the Judah, are they going out and attacking all the nations? No, I don't think so. Because it's coming... Because it says that they're the fire pot and wood. <clears throat> and the torch and the sheaves... Yes, who are coming to Jerusalem. So, are you drawing, Patty? <laughs> the way I saw it is that the attacks would come in and Judah would be the first to come out and, and respond. Well, with it. they're wanting to attack Jerusalem, but they're also wanting to take care of, and remember, why is it saying Judah? Why is it saying Judah instead of Israel? Because Israel was wild in it, right? Yeah, because who's who is Zechariah? He's a Jew from Judah. And who's he talking to? The exiles, the Jewish exiles that came from Babylon. So the reference is Judah, not Israel. But who is it talking about? What's going to happen at the time of this? It's going to be all of Israel. So when we literally, when we read Judah, I mean, that was their context. But we should think Israel. So when we see this, what's it, they're not just taking out Jerusalem. And also in verse 2 it says that. What's that? It says, and when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. Exactly. So they're, they're, not, they're, they're going to not just want to take out just Jerusalem, the city, 
they want to take out all of Israel. What do we hear? I, um, uh, I said Iraq earlier. I meant Iran. What do we hear Iran saying all the time? They want to wipe Israel off the map. These countries are going to want to come against Israel. Why? Because Israel is God's chosen people. And they've been trying, I mean, the whole world, we see the whole world right now wanting to blot out Israel. How? Well, Palestine. Jerusalem is the headquarters of Palestine, the Palestinian land. It's not Palestine, it's Israel. It's Israel. It's God's land that he gave to Israel. So they're going to want to um, wipe out all of it. And then it says in verse 7, the Lord also will save the tents of Judah first. So the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. Who normally lives in the city compared to who lives out in the outskirts out in the country? The merchants. Yeah, it's kind of the well-to-do guys that are in the city, right? Yeah. And the, you know, the farmers, farmers the sheep shepherds. Yeah, the, you know, they're the like ranchers right? and the regular people, yeah. my family that lives <laughs> out in literally out in the out in the booties, out in the outskirts. But it's it's saying that the Lord's going to save Judah first. Saying, Jerusalem's not more important. The people on the outskirts are just as important. He's going to save them first. Um, but then it also says, um, let's see. Um, God himself will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Who's that? It's Jesus. He's the one that's going to be coming and battling in this battle, Right. But, and there's going to be some strength going on here, though, that they're going to be given. And it kind of makes me think of Samson because it says in verse 8, the feeble will be great warriors like King David. Why would that be significant to them? Who was King David to them? No, he's like Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. Together. I can't hear you. He's like Abraham Lincoln and George Washington together. Yeah, really to, good leaders. And, to the Jews, yeah. I mean, he was the warrior that constantly went out to battle, defeating Philistine after Philistine, and all the, you know, they, what did they say? Saul killed his thousands, and, thousands and, and David, David killed, killed his ten thousands. thousands. Yeah, oh, yeah, David was the, the great warrior. So they're saying the feeble, the old feeble people are going to be like the warrior, King David, and the house of David, meaning I think that means the leaders, will be granted superhuman strength, like God, like the angel of the Lord. By the way, do you see that it says like God and like the angel of the Lord together in the same breath? God the Father, Jesus, the angel of the Lord, <clears throat> together, you know? Um, we'll be like God, we'll be like the angel of the Lord before them. So they're going to be granted strength. There, it, I always pictured it was, you know, the whole thing is just Jesus speaks and it's done. But this indicates that they're going to be doing some battling, too, that God's going to enable them to do some battling as well. That was new to me. Do you get this, that, Fred? Uh, no. No? What do you get? <laughs> At least in this uh, skirmish. Yeah. Because I don't think it's... I think this is not the one in Megiddo. No, it's not the one in Megiddo. It's in Jerusalem. There's multiple campaigns. Campaign, that's the word. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's just one campaign, and it's just the one battle. And... I think the only one that's going to be doing any killing or exacting wrath is Jesus. I agree that there will be, that Jesus will be the only one doing so, any wrath. Any believers at this time, Jew or Gentiles, I don't think they will be doing any killing. I agree with that. Yeah. Jesus will be the one so doing I, killing. The, any battles, I think, is done by. People of oh, well, Jewish people that are not believers. Jewish people that are not believers. Huh. Um, interesting. Meaning the clans of Judah. Killing what? The clans of Judah. I don't think they're believers yet. Here. Yes, I agree. I don't think they're believers here, but I also think there are multiple campaigns with the army with the Battle of Armageddon. I don't. Yep. We can agree to disagree, but there's multiple places where I've seen different locations, so through scripture. 
and I don't have those references, but I did when we were in Revelation, we talked about those different campaigns. So, and I also wonder, where do they come out of hiding? Where does who come out of hiding? Petra, those that are maybe in Petra. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, which is another, that's one of the locations where God is going and protecting them. When Pet, where, not Petra, but the wilderness location, <laughs> wherever that wilderness right. location is. So where was. do they come out to come back to Jerusalem to fight? I always wondered. That's a good point. I mean, because <laughs> there's people here who are fighting, and then there's, uh, and this would have to be towards the end of the tribulation, which is when they're in hiding. So who is it here? So that makes sense then that these are not people who know the Lord yet. Hmm. I don't. But I, when it says House of David, I think of uh, Mary and Jesus, and I think of also Gentiles and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I think of worshipers of the one true God. Hmm. Okay. Let's hold that off for a minute because we're going to expand on that when we get um, slightly further down here, I believe. Yes. And uh, that's why I think they can't, Antichrist and the nations can't do anything against the believers. And when, the how can they not, what, when you say they can't do anything against the believers? There's no really believers left them. <laughs> well, yes, it would be. The <laughs> inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the house of David, I are believers in Jesus, God, and God. The clans of Judah are non-believing Jews. Oh, I didn't get it that way. I, I saw it differently. Uh, it's, that's a, it's so interesting. they were saying, hey, there's God is with the inhabitants of Jerusalem, with the house of David. I'm taking courage and I'm going to be bold and going out and attacking. But I don't think they're believers. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting thought. So the people who are actually saved are actually being protected right now at this point? Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Okay. Huh. Well, let's go on. Let's look at verses 10 through 14. Ready? I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of house of David by itself, the, their wives by themselves, the family of house of Nathan by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shiamites by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. Okay. So, so I don't, just kind of think it was with yes. Fred's thought, is right. it? Even if the clan of, Jerusalem, clan of Judah doesn't believe it in 7 and 8, they do in 10, 10, through, yes. 10 right. through 14. Yes. Because they see the... They see um, Jesus. And they, they see the... They pierced. Conquering Messiah. And they see, this, they see the person they pierced, and they recognize that, hey, right. we, and then they we say, didn't believe... Our fathers didn't believe, in them, believe them. Right. And they mourn tremendously and individually and did you see the two terms of how they mourn they mourn bitter weeping over a firstborn who's jesus the firstborn um they mourn for an only son who's jesus the only son they realize who he is and they're cut to the quick that all these years their ancestors and them have rejected the Messiah who's now coming to save them. Wow. The mourning, the embarrassment, the shame that they would feel. And that mourning is repentance. The spirit of grace comes over them. God does not want them to perish. He wants them to repent and come to him. And so they do. And so they see Jesus. They believe the God removes the veil. Remember, there's a veil over their eyes veils over their eyes right now in the times of the Gentiles so that the opportunity for the Gentiles to come to salvation at this point when Jesus returns the veil is removed from their eyes and they see who he is but just seeing him isn't enough they still 
like all of us, have to choose. They have to choose if they're going to repent and trust in him. And those who do are going to, uh, are going to be saved. And it says, um, it was the previous verse wasn't where they said that they would be saved. But I'll tell you something ahead of time because I've said this wrong, um, that they would all be saved. Nope, they're not all going to be saved. Only those who choose. There's going to be those who do not choose. Just like with the Gentiles, there are going to be those who choose and those who don't. It's hard to imagine that anyone could see and not believe. Yet, when we go back and we look at the Gospels, we look at look at those who refused to repent and believe. And who were they? They were those that didn't want to submit. They they wanted to hold their pride, and they didn't want to they didn't want to submit. So. What I got out of the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, I was trying to put this together. And Fred, you might be right. Um, I was looking at it as the house of David is the leaders of Israel and the inhabitants of Jerusalem um, is more um, th those who lived in Jerusalem. But I think I like yours better. Yours is making more sense. Um, now, something that confused me in verse 10 if you look at that, so they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. It changed. They will look on me whom they've pierced, and they will mourn for him. Why does it go from me to him? Does that bug anybody else? Because the, <clears throat> the um, God has changed in that picture. First it's, he's talking about Jesus, and then he's talking about the Lord God. It's apparently just prophetic language. Is it? Yeah. Then in prophetic language, there's a bunch of examples of where it'll refer, they'll suddenly start referring to third person when, okay. they're, when they're talking about a prophecy. It's like, hey, that was just messed up. I don't like that. One is whom they have pierced. It's past tense because Christ has been ah, crucified. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. And then it's present tense whom they... They're mourning because Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. Right. So it would be present tense. Wait a minute. What? You lost me there. The, whom whom it, they have pierced, past tense. Yes. Me who they have pierced, past tense. And they will mourn for him, future tense. Yeah. Right. Which is the prophecy part. So, so when it's, it's what's happening in the future. Yes. So the future prophecy... Is third person is is well, it's kind of really really interesting because this is written before and then it says whom they can you speak have up a little rich i'm sorry I'm sorry um so they're talking basically this is written you know like 500 years before yes but then he's saying whom they have pierced yes and then like it's past for them they're talking about the future about you know they will mourn Yes, so, I mean, it's looking ahead to the it's future. It's on the future for them. But, but it, this is speaking in the terms of the future at Jesus' second coming. Yeah. Me who they have pierced pass from that point. And then, yeah, it, it gets a little, this is where I, it was like, this is a little confusing, isn't it? But it makes a little more sense when we go, okay, that, and I like the way Fred said so it. You, got, can't, you almost have to get, he, he's talking like, he is, Zechariah is talking like he's there in the there at that time when he's, when he's, he's reading this almost. Yes, yes. It's like he's looking ahead as he's seeing this. Because um, when he's talking to him, he's not, it's not it's still way in the future. I also wonder if that's why Jewish tradition or beliefs is that there are two messiahs. Huh. Huh. One messiah is the suffering messiah, and the other messiah is the conqueror messiah. Conquering Messiah. And they see it as two different people? Correct. Wow. Mm. So you have, it's Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David, David being David. So it's... So, so they're going to be really surprised to see that the suffering Messiah is the conquering Messiah. And so I think that's when they, the clan of Judah or the tents of Judah are now realizing it's one Messiah. Yeah, yeah. Sue is asking a question. Um, are they mourning because they missed who he was the first time? Yes, 
Absolutely. That is why they are mourning. And, and uh, let's see. Or is it mourning because of her sins that caused him to be pierced? Both. I, I, maybe it's both. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the, the fact that they rejected him, I mean, that's got to be, oh my gosh, it was God that we were rejecting. Yeah, guilty or but they, the guilt. Realized. Yeah. They knew, at least the, uh, the high priests knew who he was. Covered it up even after the fact because they, there's certain readings of the Bible that they don't go over anymore. They know now, but I don't think if they knew it was the Messiah then. I just, I think their hearts were too hardened mm. for mm -hmm. them to see truly who he was, and I mean, they were hardened because of their own pride. But I thought they knew after he died, when there was the earthquake and the the temple split apart, and well. They never chose to believe, though. Correct. Yeah. So, I, I guess. I think the only ones mourning here are those that are believers. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're, we're talking two different things. We are talking about two different things. Okay. Um, let's let's kind of look at some of this mourning because some of it we can understand, but it, it gets a little confusing. So let's just understand what some of these things are. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David. Okay, we understand who the house of David is. Um, the house of Nathan, remember there was the prophet in David's time, so that the house of David would kind of denote the leaders of Israel. Nathan was a prophet, so that would, it would represent the prophets, if we want to look at it that way. And then it also mentions Levi and the Shiamites. The Shiamites... Um, Let's see, um, I've got that noted. It was the grandson of Levi. Uh, it's somewhere in my notes here. Here we go. Uh, Sh Shimei, S-H-I-M-E-I, -E was the grandson of Levi. And so the Shiamites would represent the priests, their associates, all the way down to the temple workers. So we've got all the different classes represented as those mourning. Again, though, are they going to mourn if they don't realize that he's the Messiah that they've rejected? No, they're probably not. It's the ones who are choosing to believe that are mourning. And then also notice it says, um, where's the bit about had it? Hey, dad, remember, 11, there it is. 11, in 11, in that day, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of hey, dad, Rimen. And you, you skip over that going, well, what in the world is hey, dad, Rimen? You know, because we don't, we're not familiar with that. Well, um, hey, dad, Rimen is in the plain of Megiddo. And uh, the, the most godly king of the Judean line, King Josiah, was killed at Hadad Rimen by uh, Pharaoh Necho II. And so this godly loved king, when he was killed, there was great mourning. So it's comparing all these different ways of mourning, and it will be mourning like the loss of the greatest king of all of Judah, like the mourning of Hadad Remens. But if we don't know that, you know, it's like, okay, I don't, I don't really get what that is. So tremendous amount of mourning. And I find it really interesting that they say um, the families of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves. It's, we think of corporate mourning a lot of times with church or with these groups, mm -hmm. but it's dividing it out. It's individuals. They're going to mourn. It's individuals. Why is that important? Because some people will choose and some people won't to, to mourn. Say it again. Some people will choose to mourn and others won't. Yes, but there's a there's a concept in a lot of Christian churches today that um, we we welcome people into the family of God. And because their family believes, then they all believe. This isn't corporate belief. This isn't corporate mourning. Each individual has to choose to mourn. And as Fred, I think it was Fred, somebody over there, said mourn their sins. Mm -hmm. And in this case, also mourn that they chose not to believe that he was the Messiah. So they're mourning their sins. They're mourning the, the, the fact that they missed the Messiah but it's got to be an individual effort. It's got to be each individual choosing for themselves. We can't stand before God and say, well, you know, 
I didn't believe because my dad didn't believe, and my husband didn't. No, we individually. So what does it mean by the lamb shall mourn? The what? <clears throat> Where it says on the beginning of 12, the land shall mourn. Yeah, the land will mourn. So is that something like the, the, the land will physically like you know, be brown or something? I don't know. <laughs> because it's, cause later on, it's going to say that the land will be blessed. And it's going to talk about um, just tremendous um, overflow of fruit. Mm -hmm. So it kind of does seem to indicate that there would be... Um, some damage to the land. We know that the land has also been uh, cursed. Mm -hmm. So now the land is mourning, you know, and we, we also noticed um, earlier, we were looking at complete destruction. I think that was in the first, first part. Um, yeah, in, in verse four, in that day declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderment. It's not just the riders, it's the animals. So we see the people, the animals, and the land complete. Everything is mourning. And we don't really think about it that way. So when they're talking about a horse, are they talking about, like, you know, airplanes and aircraft? And, uh, <laughs> That's a good Foster. question. I don't know. But I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think we can know that. Yeah, because back then, you know, a horse was, you know. A real horse. A real horse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like is it going to be a... Is a it going to be a tank? Yeah. Is it going to be some type of robot thing? Because we don't know how far in the future this is actually going to be. So yeah. will it be horses? Or could it be by that time everything is so destroyed that it, it is horses? It's horses. Yeah. What, what do you think, Fred? I think it's a certain amount of symbolism in the sense of even when it was written, horses were a symbol of power. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and a horse was usually used in warfare. They weren't used for plowing because they're not strong enough. I'll just say it that way. Oh. But so is uh, warfare, oh. horsepower. So I think it could be mechanization of warfare it, and God intervenes and so their weapons don't work. Horses are been like leaders, you know, power leaders. Yeah. So, so they're going to... I think it could be. Jesus is going to return. He's going to save them. They're going to be offered salvation. Um, and do you get it's at the very last minute, at the at the eleventh hour, they're still being offered salvation. That's a loving God, isn't it? Never gives up on us. He's always hoping, wanting us to repent. But what, if they've gotten the mark of the beast. Not, that's that true. Point, at that point, they're, offered, they're no. There's there's no there's no. Um, I picture the mark of the beast guys are fighting with the other side. Yeah, yeah. I think they're part of the nations fighting. You know, part of all the nations coming against them. The okay. only ones who can I, repent are those who have not received the mark of the beast. Yeah, yeah. Because that yeah. So, but each of us has to make the decision um, to choose Jesus now, in the past, in the future. That's always the decision, and it's about humbling ourselves. Are we willing to humble ourselves and realize, boy, we're nothing without God? That's really the question. And we are at 7.58, so we're going to end here. Um, we've kind of gone through and picked this apart pretty well. I would ask you guys to read it again and see if it makes more sense now after we've kind of pulled it apart. But is there a piece that's application for you? There's, a, there's an interesting thing about David in here. Extra letter in there compared to all the ones that are mentioned in this chapter, as opposed to the other than David's last name. What's that, Amos? Uh, it's, it's, it's usually it's three letters for David, but then they add another another uh, another letter in there. Huh? Why do you think that is? Uh, the letter that they add, uh, it's the sixth letter of the Hebrew, the Vav, which. Uh, Okay. So I thought it was kind of interesting. Okay. So it's trying to get that the Hebrew does that. They try to do things kind of out of the out of ordinary so that you get your attention. So, huh. Interesting. So, yeah. What else? What's in, what's sticking out to you okay, out of chapter 12? As far as mourning and the earth, Romans 8, 19, 
for the anxious longing of the creation. For the ancient, not ancient, anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revelation, revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation will also win. I memorized this in NIV and I'm reading it in NASB and it's just not working. If you guys can kind of try to always <laughs> speak up so that the people, we've got like six people watching online so they can they can hear too. So that was Romans 12. Talk, Romans 8 verse 12. Romans 8 verse 12 talking about the futility of the it's land. It's talking about the earth mourning and going through childbirth pains Okay. and waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Ah, talking about the earth mourning and going through childbirth pains. Great. Now, that was great. That was a great verse. Application. What are you taking? One thing. Just one point from this chapter. Um, back in, uh, in verse 8 and 9, when you asked what was the point of uh, Judah being chosen over Jerusalem, uh, it was because those people uh, in Judah were considered outside Jerusalem and not as important. Well, everybody can point. Yeah. And so. To God. To God. Everyone's important, which means what for us? Well, the same, that we need to witness to everybody. Exactly. Huge application. That's a great application. If, if the people on the outskirts are important to God, then the people on the outskirts need to be important to us. Important enough for us to pray for and share Jesus with. Excellent. Someone else. What's a point of application? What stands out for me is like God's grace and care that shows and it's just we should too uh -huh. have God's grace towards others. Yeah. Tina said God's grace is what really stands out because this is at the tail end and he's still wanting people to come to faith. So then we need to show that same grace with the people that we struggle with. <laughs> right? Because this is people that God has struggled with. And, and he's still extending that grace. We need to do the same thing. Great, great, great application. Someone else. I'm still, still trying to get my whole head around the whole chapter. Get your whole head around. Is there any point that sticks out to you that you're like, aha? Uh, I think it's amazing that, uh, you know, people finally realize Yeah. That's really just kind of mind blowing. It is mind blowing. And, and that's kind of where I go. It's mind blowing to me that this was written 500 years before Jesus was born. Yeah. Or, you know, I don't like to say born, but yes, before he took on human flesh. And it says, so they will look on me whom they pierced. The details that are in there, you know, it's, it's all laid out. He's always made himself known. And they missed it. We miss it. We still, we miss it too. It's there. It just, it's so reassuring to me. God's laid out exactly what's going to happen. He's told us what's going to happen. He's got it all together. We don't have to worry. That's a common Sue. I know you're in there watching. That's a common Sue phrase. Uh, we don't have to worry. God's got it all figured out. We just have to stay close to him and give people love and grace, pray for them, share Jesus with them. Someone else, what's your application? We've got it. It's 8.03. We're going to close here. Okay, so next week we'll be in Zechariah 13. Um, that is just nine verses, if I remember right. And yes, nine. And so we'll go through Zechariah 13. And then the following week, hopefully 14, um, we will not have... A, I, in the email, if you guys received the email, I said, hey, we can get done with 13 and 14, then March 30th, we can have a potluck. We will not have a potluck on March 30th because March 30th is um, worship night here. So we will have food. We can still, we can have, the, the food will be food trucks here and um, mm -hmm. there'll be a bunch of tables set up and then we have worship night, which is awesome. So Tina, Amos, any of the rest of you, please please join us for worship night. And then I need you guys to let me know if you would like to have a potluck after that. 
you know, just a fellowship potluck before we start our next study, which will be First Timothy. That's also we can. We can do Bible trivia. What's that? <laughs> do Bible trivia the same night as a we could we could do Bible while trivia. While we eat, some Bible trivia. We could we could do some Bible trivia while we eat. Yeah, <laughs> Brad against the rest of us. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and close. Lord, thank you for um, helping us dissect a tough chapter. And we didn't understand it all, but we got the points that you wanted us to get. And we, we also learned how to list things out, how to reference um, some of the original language, how to look at different versions, how to uh, highlight different words and combine them together. Um, we're learning, Lord. We're a work in progress. And we just thank you for revealing yourself to us today. We thank you for those that you're going to reveal yourself to in the future. We thank you for the grace that you've given us all. We thank you for your patience with us all when we get cocky and full of ourselves. Lord, let us be humble. Let us remember that we can't accomplish anything unless you accomplish it through us. Lord, show us who we need to share you with, who we need to pray for. And Lord, give us the patience to give others grace and love. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, everybody. Uh, we'll be back here next week, God willing, for Zechariah 13.